Buenas noches. Buenas noches. You know, I can't believe that there are still people sitting here at nine o'clock at night. Thank you. <laughs> I love working with diehards, you know, people who fight till the end. Those of you who did stay, in my view, and I'm a little biased, that was worth the trip to hear that last presentation from Alex Tapscott. I'm biased, but that was a tour de force. And we were all very fortunate to hear that complete explanation of this new paradigm in technology and what some of the opportunities are. Now, let me begin with a little background about what I'm going to tell you tonight. I wrote a couple of books in the 1980s. I know I'm dating myself. And uh, they were books that nobody read. I think my mother bought most of the copies. Yes, mom. But I started writing bestsellers in the early 1990s. Paradigm Shift, obviously a big book. And The Digital Economy was the first bestseller about the web and business. And 20 years later, I was asked to write the anniversary edition of The Digital Economy. And I had to think about where have we been and where are we going? And I came to a number of conclusions. One was that the internet and the digital age is entering a second era. We've had mainframes, mini computers, PCs, the internet, the web, social media, mobile web, the cloud, big data. And now technology is moving into this second era. Alex described it as the Web3 era where we have these extraordinary technologies, blockchains and internet of value. We have AI and technologies that can not just predict and help us make good decisions, but can learn and soon can learn to do things that we haven't programmed them to do. We have the Internet of Things, billions soon trillions of inert objects in our world that are smart and communicating. They're also doing transactions. When that light bulb buys some power from a distributed power source and promptly pays for the power it's purchased, its reputation as a trustworthy device will be enhanced. And that transaction is not going to go through Visa. Okay? It's going to go through a blockchain network. And finally, we have XR, the virtual worlds and so on. And as Alex explained, we need a, a Web3 view of those, not a Mark Zuckerberg view of the metaverse as Disneyland, but a distributed central, decentralized metaverse where the assets and the value that you create are owned by you. So this is a very powerful new technology. And Alex described some of the opportunities. I have a tough job tonight because I want to talk to you about some of the problems. And I want to speak to you very frankly. And for those of you who did stay here, I have a very immodest ambition. I would like you to think about what you're doing with your life. Now let me explain that. In the digital economy, I was very upbeat about the web. I said, it's going to do all these wonderful things. You know, the book held up very well. They all happened. But I also had a section called the dark side, things that could go wrong. I said, and I'll talk to you today about six things. I said, our privacy could be undermined in an irrevocable way. Small handful of technology companies could capture our data. That happened. Check. I said, I think the internet will contribute to prosperity, but we could have the opposite happen. There could be a bifurcation of wealth where the economy grows, but the middle class shrinks, where the rich get richer, but everyone else falls behind. Check. I said, 
I think the internet will bring us all together. Medium to communicate. Parents, grandparents can talk to their grandchildren far away. Well, a lot of that happened, but what we've seen mainly is the opposite. We've seen a fragmentation of public discourse where we all follow our own little point of view and we end up in these self-reinforcing echo chambers. I think for a lot of people, the purpose of information is not to inform them, it's to give them comfort for their preconceived ideas. I said, I think the internet will help us build better governments and better democracies. Is there anyone here who thinks that we have a better democracy because of the internet? Look at the United States today. The opposite happened. I said, I think this technology will enable us to mobilize in the world and fight against climate change. Well, there's some very exciting things happening with technology, but we're losing that battle. And finally, I said, I think AI is going to be this extraordinary new technology that can contribute vastly to prosperity and the human enterprise. Well, it's certainly doing that, but as Alex said, there's a dark side to that. We're on the threshold of technologies that can not only learn, but they can think, and they can make decisions. We've never had technologies that can make decisions. Trains couldn't make decisions. Nuclear power was a powerful technology, but it couldn't make decisions. The internet changed many things, but the internet did not make decisions. We're now moving into a world where technology is sentient, and this raises a whole number of challenging issues. So what are we going to do about this? Well, I'd like to throw out a challenge to you. Most of you are pretty young people in this audience. <laughs> That's a picture of me with my sword. I was until recently the chancellor of a university in Canada. I spoke to many, many classes of young people. And I would say to them, and <laughs> I gave so many speeches, the university summarized them all and turned it into a book. But I would say to them, congratulations, young people, you're growing up in an amazing period in history, and you're graduating from a good university, you're all going to get jobs, set up a company, and I wish you all well. By all means, have a great life. But unfortunately, the world needs more from you. You see, the world that my generation is leaving you is too conflicted, it's unsustainable, it's too unequal, and it's getting worse. And there are many growing injustices in the world. And your generation is being called forth by history to address these problems. These are the problems of the digital age. And my hope is that you will not just go out and be prosperous and have a great business and so on, but think about how you can build a consequential life. Now, in the rest of this speech, I'd like to show you what needs to be done and specifically what you can do. I've never given this talk before, so we'll see how it goes. I think we need a new social contract for the digital age. Are you familiar with that idea of a social contract? Anybody? It's an agreement that we have in society about how things should work between the private sector, government, the civil society, NGOs, and you as citizens. You know, and when we went from the industrial age, or sorry, from the agrarian age to the industrial age, we built a social contract. We figured out that, um, that people would be living in the cities so we needed to build a social safety net. We figured out that people needed to be literate to work in factories. We created the public education system. We created a law. You have to go to school. It's against the law to not go to school. 
We created public markets and all the things that Alex was talking about. We've done none of that for the digital age, in my view. So what would a new social contract look like and then what can you do to get us there? Well, let's look at those six problems. Let me describe for each the problem and the old solution to that problem. And then I'm going to give you a new solution that you probably haven't heard of before. Okay, the problem of the commandeering of our data. Alex described it. It's kind of like a digital feudalism. You know, prior to the revolution in Mexico, and, the, um, and when Mexico became a, an independent nation state, it was largely a feudal economy, and it was owned by wealthy landowners in Spain. And this happened all around the world. You would grow some produce, and the landlord would take most of it away, and you'd be left with a few vegetables for yourself. Well, today, you create the asset of the digital age, data through your activity. Your body creates medical data as you interact with the system. You create all kinds of data every time you do a transaction, every time you take a test, every time you drive somewhere, every time you have a location. All this data gets captured by a very small handful of people. Alex and I call it a digital conglomerate. We've never seen these things before. Seven companies own half of the NASDAQ stock market. These are companies that can rapidly evolve into adjacent and not so adjacent industries through their ownership of data. So what are we going to do about this? Well, a lot of people talk about the problem. Shosana Zubor, Zuboff in a magisterial work called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. But the solutions so far are very limited. How are we going to protect our privacy? How do we deal with data? We need governments to do that, right? GDPR. Government laws will protect us. I don't, I don't think that's sufficient. It may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Let's have a whole new approach. You don't need a government to protect your data. You need to own your data. It's your data. You created it. And now with blockchain and Web3 technologies and AI, all this transactional data can be swept up into a self-sovereign identity that through AI is at your command and you make decisions. Maybe I'm going to give away this medical record to research. Maybe I'm going to get a second opinion on my medical record. Maybe I'm going to try and anonymize it and sell it. So Alex mentioned this, and I'm not going to go into it more. The notion of a self-sovereign identity is going to be critical. Can Mexico be the first country in the world where the data that citizens create is owned by them? Challenge number two, the prosperity paradox. You know, this is incredible. This is the first time in modern history where across Western countries, the economy is growing, the middle class is shrinking. There is wealth creation and declining prosperity. And this is staggering the way that it's happening. Now, it's happening in the United States and in more advanced countries in the world. And it hasn't been happening so much in the developing world, but now that's starting to occur as well. And if this trend continues, this is the stuff of class war. If you get big enough divides and people feel that they just can't get ahead economically, that can be a really big problem. Now, the other thing, when I wrote The Digital Economy, I said, I think the internet will contribute to jobs. Technology always has. Has anyone heard of Schumpeter, an economist named Schumpeter? He's a very famous guy, and he said, it's a great thing about capitalism is new technologies come in and they smash old structures and institutions, but they create more. They create more jobs and wealth. Well, that happened, didn't it? 
during the whole period of the internet, but now get ready for a new wave of these technologies that can cause massive disruption to labor markets. You know the number one job type in the United States for men is truck driver in 50 of 51 states. That's gone in a decade. The number one job type for women is cashier. Well, that's gone, but it's not just these blue collar type jobs. AIs can analyze x-rays better than radiologists and they can dispense pharmaceuticals. I know, thank you for that applause. Um, they can dispense pharmaceuticals better than pharmacists. So get ready for big disruptions to labor markets. How do we fix this problem of prosperity? Well, the old solution is the redistribution, uh, redistribution of wealth through higher taxes, right? And benefits program. Well, I think there's plenty of that to be done. And maybe Elon Musk ought to pay some taxes. Warren Buffett, to his credit, says his secretary pays more taxes than he does. But maybe we could have a new solution. Rather than the redistribution of wealth, maybe we could have the pre-distribution of wealth. Maybe we could change the way the economy works to make it more open and democratic so that the creators of wealth benefit more directly as you don't today. Now, how could that be done? Well, this is a whole one-hour speech, which I'm not going to give you today. But, um, and I talked about a lot of this in my uh, second TED Talk. But first of all, we can protect rights through immutable records. You know, uh, Hernando um, de Soto, the great Latin American economist, says that 70% of land titles in Latin America are not enforceable. And he says that's more important than being banked to prosperity. Through blockchain, you can protect land titles. So in Honduras, a dictator comes to power and he says, well, you may own your farm, but my government computer says my friend owns your farm. This can help eliminate the corruption involved in land titles and protect these critical assets for people. We could create a true sharing economy. You know, they call Uber and Airbnb the sharing e economy. There's nothing sharing about these companies. They're successful precisely because they don't share. Uber can be replaced with software so that the drivers can receive all of the benefits. And we wrote about how that can happen in blockchain revolution. Alex mentioned the remittance ripoff. Rip -off. This is a trillion dollars a year. A doctor in Toronto, a Mexican doctor, sends money to her mother in Guadalajara and she gets charged 12% for it. That's ridiculous. Cross-border payments. You ever heard of cross-border payments for email? Well, sending information is now becoming about as easy as sending money. They're both the same. That's a trillion dollars we could bring back into the economy. Enabling citizens to own and monetize their own data. Do you know that uh, Jared Lanier says that there are a billion and a half people in the world that if they own their own data could double their income. How about ensuring compensation of creators? Alex talked about how culture needs a new business model. And right now, songwriters and artists and all kinds of cultural contributors are being ripped off because the internet broke the old model for culture. And Alex also talked about Ronald Coase and that his view of why we have corporations. Well, transaction costs in an open market are dropping so much because of Web3 that we are in the early days of new decentralized models of value creation. DAOs, who's heard of a DAO in this audience, okay? Decentralized autonomous organizations that don't have a traditional uh, management board or ownership structure. And that's coming into science, DSI. It's coming into education. It's coming into manufacturing decentralized models of the firm. All of these can help us change the way the economy works rather than just taxing people more. Okay, 
Problem number three, public discourse. Anyone see a video of Nancy Pelosi stuttering with a terrible speech impediment? She doesn't stutter, and that video was a complete fake. And probably before the election, you're going to see Joe Biden get up on the internet and he's going to say, it's true, the American election was fate, and I tricked everybody, and I'm really uh, working for Putin. You know, Joe Biden's going to say that in a deep fake. This is a big, big problem. This fragmentation of public discourse means that we not only are fragmenting into different tribes, but the whole concept of what is the truth is being challenged. Do you know that there are 40% of the American population that think that the last, last election was stolen? It was a fake. That election that just occurred in the United States is the most scrutinized election in American history and maybe ever in any election in the world. Every vote was counted like dozens of times with lawyers and computer scientists and people from all the different parties and everyone involved agreed. You might be talking about 20 votes or something, but the election was not fake. But these people think it. But it's worse than that. See, it's one thing to think the election was faked. It's another thing to have this whole reality where the election was faked and climate change was a hoax um, brought, brought on us by the Chinese and, uh, and uh, government. And uh, science uh, is a fake and, and uh, climate change is another hoax. And Taylor Swift is part of the deep state that's trying to manipulate Americans into doing things so that all our basic rights can be taken away and on and on. Bill Gates is trying to put chips in our brain, etc. You know, there was a thing called Manufacturing Consent, a very famous book written by a guy named Noam Chomsky. Well, now we have unscrupulous people manufacturing reality, where people live in alternative realities. Now, if there's no concept of the truth, there can be no trust and no social capital in society. How are we going to solve this problem? Well, the only thing I've heard is we all need to take responsibility to be informed. How do we inform ourselves as citizens when the old way of doing that is collapsing? The old media that used to bring us together and you watch the evening news or read a trustworthy newspaper. Well, I have a different view. I think that we need a whole new model of the media and of education to create a 21st century informed and intelligent society. And Web3, especially blockchain, AI, can help us do that. How so? Well, we can recognize the truth if we start to move media onto a blockchain. If someone says, uh, Joe Biden just confessed to an extramarital affair, then you can go and track that statement down to the Florida conspiracy group that created it. Now, that's just part of the problem. Identifying the truth does not mean that people will accept it. The truth is crystal clear about things like climate change or the effect of public health. You know, I'm from Canada. The death rate from the COVID, vac uh, COVID um, uh, virus in Canada was one third of what it was in the United States just because people believed in public health. That's hundreds of thousands of human lives. But that truth is well known. It's not accepted. So we're going to have to do more than just be able to establish what's the truth. One thing we're going to have to do is fix the education crisis. Big problem in America, and I'm speaking to that because this is the center of this problem, is that people are uneducated. And the school system is based on regions where if you're in a poor region, your school is poor. 
And a lot of people just don't know basic information. They don't know about cause and effect. They don't know anything about history. And if you study history, you know about, it can give you some clues as to what's happening today. I think in the United States that we're in the early days of the kind of thing that we saw in Germany in the uh, mid-1930s, where there was a deep divides in society, armed groups starting to move around, and scrupulous politicians mobilizing. So, if you're taking STEM, and that's great, we need more STEM in Mexico, shouldn't we also study some history, and maybe some sociology, and maybe some arts, Let's add an A, arts, to STEM and call it STEAM. Federal, federal government in Mexico is focused on STEM. Let's make it STEAM. We need to enhance media, media literacy. You know, my, I have a granddaughter, six years old. She's very fortunate. She goes to a terrific school. They have media literacy classes where they look at advertisements and try and see what's being said here. Or they study media and try and figure out if that's true or not. Why don't we have media literacy in every single grade? Interestingly, we need to pre preserve our privacy because, you know, people say to me, well, Don, privacy's dead, get over it. If you've got nothing to hide, what's your problem? This is stupidity. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And all this data that's been taken from us represents our digital identities. We need to get that back so we can manage it responsibly for ourselves and where we can have the right to have points of view that are private in our own lives. This is not going to happen by some government passing a law. This will happen through a movement. It will require a mobilization of people, a movement for the truth, to fight for the real world and the notion of truth. Okay, number four, we're almost there. The internet's going to build a better democracy. Well, we have what's called a crisis of legitimacy now in countries around the world. You know, and a big exception to that is Mexico. <laughs> so you have a president who's widely respected in this country. Congratulations on doing that. But it's been declining. And, and this is legitimacy not just in government or in elected leaders and not just in business leaders, but it's in the institutions themselves. You see, legitimacy, as defined by Seymour Martin Lipset, is that you may disagree with the leader of a company or a government or whatever, but at least you think the system is the best system. Well, now, people everywhere are questioning the system. And all around the world, we have demagogues who are undermining um, basic institutions of democracy. This is a very, very fragile time. And I'm sorry to say that technology has enabled this. Now, the technology may have helped enable it, but it's not the solution, but technology can help. We have this attitude now that the best government is no government. This is a big problem. When we created the social contract for the industrial age, we understood the concept of the commons. We needed to cooperate together to create an education system, to create a social safety net, to create public health, to create all of the things that enable us to function as a society. And Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher may have had the good things to say, but overall their effect was a very negative one on undermining people's concept, not in government leaders, but in the very notion of government. Now, should we have more effective government? That's for sure. Is there a lot of corruption? That's for sure. But let's not throw away the baby with the bathwater here. How do we fix this problem? Well, everyone says, I don't know. 
We need to fix democracy. Government leaders should tell the truth. We need to elect good people. Well, that's all true. I think we need something very different. We need a whole new model of democracy. Now, bear with me here. The first era in Mexico, you know, we got rid of the old uh, Spanish uh, nobility and the kings and so on, and we created representative democracy. We established these elected institutions of governance, but there was a weak public mandate. There was opacity. You don't really know what's going on. And citizens are inert. It's a you vote, I rule model, okay? You vote, and then I'm going to rule and broadcast to you for four years, and then you get to vote again. It's a one-way, one-size-fits-all of the model of democracy. Could we reinvent that and have a second wave? Where we had transparency through blockchain and AI, where there was a culture of public deliberation. It's not you vote, I rule. You vote and then let's get engaged to build a better society together. Where citizens are active, not passive and where representatives are accountable to citizens. Now, just a sec. Representatives accountable to citizens? How could that ever happen? Well, again, the technology can help. Who's heard of a smart contract? Okay, a smart contract is a, a deal made out of software. It self-polices, it has a bank in it, you're in a supply chain, Something happens, you get paid. You do something, you get paid. Well, we could have smart contracts throughout the society. How about smart money? That'd be good, eh? You send your kid off to university and you give him some money and you hope that he, he, he uses the money for books and tuition, not for margaritas or something. Well, if, if it was smart money, you give him the money Johnny goes into a bar and he says, I'll have a reposado margarita. Give me some Casa Azul. And uh, the money says, sorry, Johnny, I don't do margaritas. You know, the money is telling him I only do books and tuition. Why couldn't we have that with a vote? The vote's inside a smart contract. So you vote not only for the politician, you vote for their program. And if they don't implement that program, there are consequences. Maybe the money doesn't flow. Maybe they don't get paid. Maybe they get censured. Maybe ultimately, if they violate the contract with the citizens enough, then they're removed from office. Now, there are all kinds of, I don't have time to go into these today, but many other things. E-voting. I don't think people are going to trust voting online unless you can have cryptographic proof that your vote that you cast was counted for the right person. It cannot be moved to somebody else and it cannot be deleted. Only this technology can deliver that. So again, don't get me wrong, technology is not the solution. Humans are the solution, but we can use this technology, if you understand it, to bring about important changes. Climate change. Do we all agree that we have a problem here? We need to reduce carbon to by 90% in the next 20 years. I was at Davos uh, with a a little group with Bill Clinton, he was saying, even if we do that, it's still going to take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. And in the meantime, some bad things are going to happen. Um, a billion and a half people are losing most of their water supply right now. And people th talk about icebergs melting and raising water levels. That's not the problem. The problem is the permafrost, mainly across Russia, and when that melts, the kind of water that brings into the oceans is unbelievable. So, and those are two of dozens and dozens of problems. You know, the best scientists say we're now approaching two degrees. And it doesn't sound like very much, but if you have a fever as a human and you have two degrees uh, Celsius, 
that really affects you, right? The scientists that I've talked to, the best people in the world, say three degrees of climate warmth is an extinction event for humans. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be um, uh, confrontational here or exaggerate. That's what I hear from the people who study this more, most closely. Why would that be? Well, the Amazon dries up and the world loses its lungs. So we have a big problem. This problem can be fixed. And there's been all kinds of wonderful improvements. Green technology is growing everywhere. But the old solution is that governments need to change our behavior through taxing carbon, uh, carbon credits. Well, don't, I'm a big believer in carbon credits, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know what we could do? I think we need to mobilize planet Earth through a technology-empowered, um, reindustrialize Earth through a technology-empowered mobilization. Do you know, the world has been mobilized before around World War I and World War II, but we were on different sides. We need to be mobilized so that we're all on the same side. And the technology can help a lot with that. Now, I'm running out of time here. Um, and I don't really have time to go into this, but it's a really juicy topic. And I spent $4 million trying to understand new models of solving problems like this. Um, how do you solve global problems? Well, after the Second World War, 44 countries got together and they started creating global institutions based on nation states. They created the, uh, the World Bank, and then the IMF, and a year later it was the UN, and ultimately uh, the WTO, World Trade Organization, and the G20 and the G8. These are all nation states, right? Well, since those days, there have been some big developments. The private sector has become a much more important player in society. There were no corporations at the table in 1944 at Bretton Woods, or just a few. Also, NGOs. There weren't any NGOs in 1944. There were 50 NGOs in the world. Today, they're what? 10% of the Mexican economy. Civil society. The other big thing that's changed is we have the internet, a way of collaborating globally. So there's a new model of global problem solving. And I'll just give you the URL. You can go there if you're interested. We call them global solution networks. Here's what they are. They got private sector, civil society, and governments working together. They're addressing a global problem. They don't have to be global, but the problem's global. They exploit this technology, and they self-organize. They are not controlled by corporations or nation states. And there are 10 types of these. And if I had time, I could just tell you the names of the knowledge networks and advocacy networks and watchdog networks, all of these performing a different function that are coming together to fight climate change. And that means that you don't have to rely on the government of Mexico to go to COP29 or whatever as your only way of fighting this thing. You can participate in one of these global solution networks. So gsnetworks.org, if you want to know more about that. It's all free. One other big development here is something called DMRV. And this is really important. Because carbon right now is opaque. Carbon credits are opaque. People have difficulty evaluating this stuff. They don't know if you pay for a credit, if something actually happens. And so there's something called the Digital Measurement, Reporting, and Verification of Carbon, where it starts with, you know, you plant a tree in the rainforest or, or you decide to use um, uh, solar power rather than coal, and that generates a carbon credit. And then ways to... 
uh, value those carbon credits and ways to watch how they're used throughout the system. Maybe they go into a product and you build a product like this, but it's a net zero product. And then you can see how it goes all the way through to when this product is ultimately doesn't work anymore and when it's destroyed. And this is the new frontier of using technology to fight climate change. And again, there's some great examples here. There's a company called Avery Dennison. Remember them? They make little stickers and forms and stuff. Well, they have a company called Atma.io that's a leader in using blockchain technology to create DMRV so the entire carbon process can now be tracked, can be measured, can be validated, and can be fully transparent. Two other quick things on this. Have you heard of NEOM, N-E-O-M? NEOM is a multi-trillion dollar city being created in Saudi Arabia. It's supposed to be a mile long, and it's uh, the height of the Empire State Building, the whole thing, it's a line, and it has a glass ceiling around the whole building that's collecting sun. And um, the technology company providing the technology for this is called Tonomous, T-O-N-O-M-U-S. And this is a picture of the CEO, Joseph Bradley, who's a real visionary and understands this whole Web3 technology and its power. And he's come up with this idea that we don't have physical reality and extended reality we're going, moving into a period where we have something he calls a singular reality, where these two will interact with each other. And they're building a city of the future based on this notion of singular reality, where you seamlessly interact between physical and digital worlds. The final point, AI. Do you remember the first time you ever used ChatGBT? I mean, it's really something, isn't it? Um, this technology is going through some very extraordinary changes. If you speak Spanish and I only speak English, we can now pull out our phones and talk to each other with a real-time translation. And I've seen technology that's coming out, not in years, but in months, where you can do a Zoom call where you're talking to someone in a different language and their mouth is moving with a different language, and you can understand that. Now that's incredibly exciting, but it's also terrifying. What if their mouth is moving and they're saying things that are different from what they actually are saying? Who controls this? How do we have transparency? And there are many, many big concerns. So Jeffrey Hinton, who's called the godfather of AI, um, is at the University of Toronto, where I was a professor for many years. And he outlines the concerns that these models are based on current data. And the current data out there in the world, it's sexist, it's racist, and it has all kinds of other problems. There are many, many issues, and ultimate, like autonomous soldiers, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen these these videos of soldiers now that can start to make decisions. In my six-year-old granddaughter's kindergarten class, they brought in an actual robot dog that they could give commands to, and this dog would give commands. It's a terrifying thing. So, and ultimately, there's the question of our human agency. You know, in your lifetime, most of the people in this room in probably in my lifetime, these AIs will look at you like we look at a, a, a chipmunk or a worm or something. Their intelligence will be so superior to ours and they will have sentience and be able to make decisions. So what if they make some decisions that they're kind of concerned about humans and that humans may be an impediment. So there are many, many big concerns. So how are we going to fix this one? Well, there are two main points of view here. 
One is allow technology companies to operate under a broad umbrella of free market capitalism. You believe in capitalism and capitalism will solve all these problems. The second is we need to regulate this. People like Elon Musk have stopped, called for a, a, a cessation of development and AI for a period of six months. Well, there will be a need for regulation, but while necessary, that's insufficient too. And again, I can go through this quickly because Alex already set you up. We don't need to just regulate AI. We need a whole new model. The model of AI is centralized. It's controlled by powerful forces. It's opaque. And what goes on will be unknown to us as the users and citizens. So Alex described that new model, and I'll just summarize it quickly for you. At every level in the AI stack, we need to move from a centralized model to an open and decentralized model. The hardware, we're going to need all the hardware in the world anyway, so why not harness the computers that exist everywhere? At the level of the basic models, the large language models, you know, we need an open source community to govern those with transparency and accountability. The data shouldn't be owned by a powerful company and controlled by that. We need decentralized ownership, governance, attestation, and decentralized payments. When you create value, you receive payment for that value. And finally, the apps themselves should be truly open. I think Alex said, oh, the only thing about open AI is its name. So we need self-auditing and smart contracts. This is not a pipe dream. This is possible. But the model of AI today is going to lead us in the wrong direction. So six challenges of the digital age. For each one, I've given you a solution that's different than the solutions that we're currently talking about. And uh, very quickly, you know, governments should protect privacy. I say, no, that's not enough. We need to own our data, not have it protected. We need to solve the problem of prosperity through the redistribution of wealth. No, no, no. Sure, rich people should pay taxes, but let's pre-distribute wealth by making the economy more democratic. That can now be done. Individuals should solve the problem of fragmentation of public discourse by informing themselves, so on. I'm being told I'm running out of time here. So what can you do about it? Well, first of all, get informed about the second era of the digital age. Actually, I'm going to go another five minutes, if that's OK, because I was given an hour for this talk, and the clock said 45. Um, take a picture. These are two great books. You know about Alex's book. The second one, I didn't write either of them. The second one is written by another Tapska, my brother Bob. It's Trivergence, about AI, blockchain, the Internet of Things coming together. Argue to your government. It's time to organize. We need a self-sovereign identity. We need DMRV. We need all the things that I talked to you about today. Initiate discussions, some of you in universities, in your workplace, in your community, to start to talk about some fresh ideas to solving these problems. Climate change initiatives. Remember those 10 types of organizations that you can get involved in to make a difference to use technology to mobilize globally. And your president should meet with me tomorrow uh, send them a message. Uh, the media here, please publish this. I do this. I meet with presidents and, and chancellors and government leaders, and I try and help them think differently about the digital age. This is a paradigm shift. When you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership. New paradigms cause dislocation, conflict, confusion, uncertainty. They're nearly always received badly.
coolness, mockery. I bet you there's some of you here who know what it's like to be received with coolness when you introduced a new idea. And vested interests fight against change. That's why leadership typically doesn't come from the top because the person at the top can't learn for the organization as a whole and they represent the old view. Leadership is your opportunity. Not your bosses, not the person sitting next to you. It's your opportunity. And history is calling you forth. I'm an optimist. These challenges are very deep deeper than anything I've seen in my life, but we can fix them if we find the will. And I'd like to end now with an analogy, if I can. At the uh, Blockchain Research Institute, we studied thousands of organizations, but we've also been studying science to try and understand these new decentralized models of value. And fish come in schools, Bees come in swarms. Starlings come in something called a murmuration. Have you ever heard that word? It's in the dictionary, English dictionary. A murmuration it refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And starlings are out over a 30 kilometer radius, foraging for food, doing their starling thing. And at night, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. And the murmuration has a function. Look on the right of the screen. See that? That's a hawk. 25 times the size of a starling. A killer of starlings being chased away by the collective power of the little birds. Scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. And when the moment is right, this magic happens. So is this some kind of fanciful analogy? Or could we learn something from it? Well, the murmuration functions according to the principles of this new social contract that I just shared with you. It's a collaboration. Trust is not achieved by a middleman. I said it's achieved by cryptography, collaboration, and clever code. This code in the DNA of the birds that gives it rules. One rule is don't bump into somebody else. Okay? Another rule is don't get too far away. The murmuration has an extraordinary interdependence that the action of a single bird is connected to the actions of the murmuration as a whole. And finally, the murmuration has an extraordinary integrity. And integrity is really the foundation of trust. What is trust? I wrote a book about this. It took me three months to write this sentence. Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. That the other party will do the right thing. Which is why a little bird will chase a, a hawk, a killer, 25 times its size because it knows that the other birds will do the right thing. What if we could connect ourselves on this planet through some kind of vast network of technology and air and cryptography and glass? What kind of problems could we solve? You know, I look at this thing and I get a lot of hope that maybe this smaller, smarter, more interconnected world that my grandchildren inherit might actually be a better one. And that this age of networked intelligence may be an age of where the promise of digital is finally fulfilled and where we can avoid the dark side and the peril. But this will take leadership and it will take you. So, Godspeed and I, I wish you the very best. Thank you very much.